Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. What's going to happen to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare? If it's repealed, what will be the impact on children, on the chronically ill, the poor? Are any of the Republican alternatives viable? We'll look at all these issues and more with my guest, Dr. Erwin Redliner, a pediatrician, public health activist, and co-founder of the Children's Health Fund, and his wife, Karen Redliner, the Chief Administrative Officer of the Children's Health Fund. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for coming in. Well, I appreciate you, it. Thank you. Um, give us a capsule explanation to start of uh, what the Children's Health Fund is. Karen? Well, the Children's Health Fund is an organization that Irwin and Paul Simon and I started almost 30 years ago. Paul Simon the singer. Paul Simon the singer and songwriter. And uh, it, the, the mission of the organization is to provide and develop health care programs for the most disadvantaged children in our country. Um, we've done that uh, and developed a national network around the country. Uh, and so we have programs in 15 states in Washington, D.C. and uh, along with the big advocacy program around uh, health care access for all children. Great. So um, I remember the very beginning mm -hmm. of the Children's Health Fund here in New York. And um, you're celebrating your 30th anniversary, right? Don't rub it in. Yes, we, yes. <laughs> yeah, we are. That's a, that's yeah. a great thing. But, yeah. um, I mean, a hallmark of the Children's Health Fund are these medically equipped vans. So Correct. just quickly tell us what these vans are like. So the idea was that a lot of the children who need care the most uh, don't really have access. They may have insurance, but they don't have access to an actual service provider. So the children, for example, when we first started the program, we were focused on children in the, uh, in the homeless shelter system of New York City. And even though in New York City's got plenty of resources, the children were having a great deal of difficulty getting care in the usual places. And it's certainly in the rural programs that we have now, even bigger problems of lack of transportation and people living in doctor shortage areas. So we developed uh, custom design, really, which Karen did and had built a, a mobile pediatric clinic, like a total doctor's office on wheels that could go where the, where the children are. Right. And we started with one, of course, back in 1987, and we're now up to more than 50 mobile clinics uh, around the country in all these uh, rural and urban sites that we've uh, developed. So the program has grown considerably. We take care of about 90,000 different children and families uh, uh, over the course of a year and on almost 4 million health encounters since the program began in 87. So Obamacare, um, it's been... Um, the, the reach of Obamacare has been extraordinary, and we've heard a lot about um, people getting coverage who have pre-existing conditions and kids who can stay on, their, on the program uh, until they're uh, 26 on their parents' um, plans. Um, but Obamacare is a great deal more than that. So can you talk a little bit about who's been helped by Obamacare? Well, let me, let me start by saying that Obamacare was really an incredible innovation and accomplishment for uh, President Obama and, and really the congressional uh, support that helped uh, actually get it through a very difficult political process, but it, it got through. And it was the first time we really had uh, a very significant change in our health care system uh, since Medicare and Medicaid were passed, you know, decades ago. And what this has allowed to happen is that we went from about 50 million people in the United States without insurance uh, to something like we're headed towards uh, uh, 30 million of those people getting actual coverage. And right now, 18 to 20 million already have that coverage, which they, which they did not have before. And many of the people who got the coverage uh, got it in spite of pre-existing conditions, which before Obamacare, which would have precluded them from getting insurance at all. Right. Um, and so the first big thing is that a lot of people got insurance, but there's many, many other aspects of this uh, bill that had this, this uh, legislation that really have benefited Americans, like the elimination of the pre-existing condition uh, prohibitions, which you mentioned before, but also many children have gotten coverage that, that, who didn't have it before. And also there's money in that. 
in that uh, legislation to provide preventive services free of cost to millions of Americans. There's money to build community health centers, which we desperately need around the country. So there's not just the focus on insurance, the, there's the actual focus on the fixing of the system in, in its entirety. So this is why a lot of us are pretty nervous with the talk of repeal. I guess it's around the trajectory for that now, but, but we have some real big challenges to overcome if we're gonna repeal Obamacare without really replacing it with something significant. Karen, can you talk a little bit about the difference, what it means um, in families for the children to have coverage versus the families of children who don't have coverage. What, why is that so significant at such a very young age? Well, access to health care is, first of all, from our perspective, a right and an important uh, resource for everyone. But for children, it has a particular value because there's so much of uh, preventive care that happens in the early stages. So the value of children going to a doctor on a regular basis is that um, they get screened, any problems get identified early, and th that can be addressed at an early stage before it develops into something more complicated and more expensive. And at the Children's Health Fund, we believe that Healthcare is a doorway not only to, uh, for children, not only for good health, but it improves the likelihood of them being ready to learn. So it has an impact beyond just their health status. It has an impact on their ability to go to school, pay attention in school, and really succeed right. in school. So these are the very things that you guys are looking out for in, in your vans when you go around and, and provide care to, uh, to youngsters. But can you talk a little bit about the kind of things that you spot because I, re I remember when you were going to the homeless hotels and motels uh, in New York. So what are the kind of things that, um, that you will identify when youngsters, when youngsters come in? Well, typically the children that we serve um, have been unstable or struggle with many things uh, in their lives. So they haven't had access to a, a regular source of health care for a long time before we come into their lives. Right. And so they've had conditions that maybe haven't been identified or, or they may have something like a seizure disorder that's out of control because they haven't had a regular uh, doctor to take care of that. So we see everything from children who are unimmunized or, or behind in their immunizations and oftentimes that keeps them from being able to go to school. Uh, to children with very complex um, chronic illnesses, uh, even, uh, you know, the whole range. But in particular, something like asthma. Mm -hmm. Asthma is a, one of the more common chronic illnesses that children have, and it's a very complex disease. It requires a, a certain uh, range of medications that have to be given at a certain time, uh, potentially, you know, allergic responses. And children that have asthma that's out of control often miss a lot of school, uh, they don't sleep well during the night, and they often end up in the hospital. So that is the type of um, condition that right. you know is really important for us to take care of. Yeah, and Karen has made the point uh, frequently that children are not made up of silos. You know, their, their health, their education, their social support, all are part of uh, the well-being of any particular child, that all of it has to be paid attention to at once. And the other thing that we find, in addition to what Karen just said, are th children who have visual problems that have not been identified or corrected, hearing problems, kids have been exposed to lead, children with uh, behavioral disorders and psychological issues that could be actually treated but are not treated and they end up being disruptive in class, unable to focus and so on. So there's a lot of these, in fact, we, we call certain uh, category of uh, problems that children have health barriers to learning mm -hmm. and these are seven conditions that we've we've hyper focused on to, to make sure that they're not issues that children have to deal with while they're in uh, a classroom folks around this table tend to think of Obamacare as something that's important and that should be maintained um, but to say that it's controversial is an understatement uh, and there have been some problems with o Obamacare so what are, what are some of the things that concern you guys about the Affordable Care Act? You know, for uh, the, let's say the progressive elements <laughs> in, right. in America, I think for decades we've been pushing to try to see if we can get a single payer system, Medicare for all or something that is uh, a directly government uh, funded uh, manifestation of what Karen said before, which is everyone's got a right to health care, it's a responsibility of government to provide it, and that's that. But because that is politically and ideologically so charged, 
I think Obamacare on a certain level was a compromise. It was the way uh, to get insurance companies uh, to agree to participate in this and pharmaceutical companies. So Obama was able to put together a plan that uh, kept it from imploding because uh, because we let's say tried to uh, we didn't we didn't try to exclude the those industries because they're just part of the system that right. we can't avoid. So we have a system that's in some ways with uh, the Affordable Care Act that's a little bit makeshift. On the other hand, it has very much accomplished what it set out to do, which is to reduce the number of uninsured people. And the other problem has been the question of cost to individuals. You know, the co-payments and the right. deductibles. Do they present a challenge because even though people now can get coverage more easily, is there uh, a extra burden of cost associated with that? And we actually have seen over the last five years a slowing of the rate of growth of costs associated with individuals getting health care. There's a lot more work to be done on that, and that, that was recognized as a problem even by Secretary Clinton and others who are supporters of the Affordable Care Act. So dealing with cost and uh, trying to make sure that the various elements like the insurance companies stay on board and provide what they need to provide was part of the reason that we have a more complex plan that we than we could have if we had just a single, yeah, single payer, yeah. right? If fewer people end up insured, uh, they tend to wait too long uh, to seek medical attention, and they tend to go to hospitals, I guess, if, they, uh, if they're sick or if they're badly injured or something like that. I've actually run into a lot of people who say, well, what's wrong with that? If you get to the hospital, you get taken care of. Well, explain what's wrong with that. Hmm. Well, there are a number of things wrong with that. First <laughs> of all, um, you know, if you don't have a regular source of care, especially as a child, you, you don't uh, get the, the conditions identified that can be uh, addressed early on and less expensively. Right. So, so, you know, early identification of problems, you can intervene, uh, uh, you know, in an ambulatory setting, which is much less expensive than going to the hospital. Um, you know, there are things that can take a, a very serious trajectory in terms of um, the development screening for cancer mm -hmm. um, that if not identified takes you to a whole other place of, you know, having a, you know, a more extreme situation to deal with right. if you've waited a long time for that. Um, but in general, I, I think there just are, it, it's a, a kind of a philosophy of, of our, our country needs to kind of think about health and wellness as something that's integral to, to what we need to do with our lives and, and our communities, you know, suffer if they don't have easy and, and affordable access to sources of health care. The Trump administration seems to have a definite intent of repealing Obamacare. What, you know, I, whether they have a replacement or not, they seem uh, intent on getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. Um, what happens if yeah. they repeal the Affordable Care Act? Well, uh, let me say something about this politically, first of all. So, so many of the things that uh, Donald Trump has done since taking office that have caused a big uproar and all sorts of reaction are really things that he promised to his constituents who voted for him. And he's delivering, he's delivering on those promises right. as abhorrent as some of these policies are. On the other hand, if he does repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, without a really good replacement, then not only will his uh, political opponents and ideological opponents be up in arms, but his own constituents, will many of them will lose the health care that they have. Which seems to be something that was uh, lost during the long campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people didn't connect to the fact, oh, this might affect me personally, which it's going to millions of people that voted for Donald Trump, if they just repeal it without replacing it, are going to find themselves in a very serious quandary so even politically, it really doesn't make any sense, and hopefully it won't make sense in 2018 at the midterms. <laughs> there as well. But also, um, you know, I mentioned uh, the, the pre-existing conditions and keeping youngsters yeah. on their parents' uh, plans. Uh, Trump and other Republicans have said that they want to keep these right. uh, elements because they're popular. Right. Um, and, so but they want to get rid of uh, things like the mandate and any taxes associated uh, with the Affordable Care Act. How is this possible? Well, let's be crystal clear about something. <laughs> this, is, this is a very key point they just mentioned, Bob. So you simply cannot have, you, you cannot get rid of the pre-existing condition prohibitions or the lifetime limits on how much health care right. you can get without having a mandate, period. <laughs> End of story. Stop. Yeah. Right. So because 
In order to be able to afford to do that, the insurance companies have to have a lot more customers who are healthy. So if they lose those healthy customers, uh, then the cost of providing care, the ones who are, uh, that have a greater prevalence of chronic illnesses and serious diseases, uh, it becomes wildly uh, unaffordable. So you simply can't have that very, you know, sort of phantasmagal uh, paradigm of no mandate yet getting the, the goodies out of what uh, the Affordable Care Act was offering. Right. Can you talk a little bit about some of the alternatives that the Republicans have proposed a, a, along the way, uh, insurance policies that would provide uh, catastrophic coverage, for example, or um, I guess health savings plans, those, those kinds of things. Um, I asked in the introduction whether any of these were viable. Um, do you think they are? Well, it's, a, it's certainly a different type of approach, but it, again, I think what happens is, with health savings plans, it, it basically you put away dollars into a health savings plan that theoretically you save money for the future and only spend it on procedures or examinations that you think are important. Well, that, of course, especially if you're a family, you know, middle income, blue collar worker, you don't have a lot of funds in general, that's going to encourage you to put off health care right. until it's absolutely necessary, um, which means, again, going to the hospital, going to the ER when you're sick. It, it, it will, and I think there's some re research already that's shown that you avoid uh, preventive care. You, you don't necessarily go to well child or well adult visits because you're right. feeling okay. So none of those, you know, early opportunities uh, to identify health care problems are, are realized. So, I, I And that's assuming, of course, that you have any money to begin with to put into a health savings account. A lot of families yeah. don't. Right. Exactly. Right. So, and don't uh, and won't. So, right. uh, for the reasons that Karen just said. I mean, what do, and I'm I sorry. Think, I think we should remember what, you know, what the, the, the motivation for increasing and expanding health care was around you know, covering those folks that didn't get health care coverage through their employer right. and, and weren't covered by Medicaid. So it's kind of that segment in between those who are, you know, working for larger companies or not self-employed and those who are, um, have low income and so get, you know, basic health care through uh, a Medicaid type of program. It's the, it's the folks in between, many of whom are Donald Trump supporters, right. who are, you know, working in a company that doesn't, you know, isn't large enough to pay for their health insurance or self-employed or, um, you know, not employed. So I, I think it's, the, it's not wealthy individuals who don't have insurance. It's, right. it's those who more often struggle. And speaking of Medicaid, uh, that one of the elements of the Affordable Care Act was a, a large expansion of yeah. Medicaid, mostly paid for uh, by the federal federal government. Medicaid, of course, uh, provides health care for poor people. Um, what happens to Medicaid if you dismantle the Affordable Care Act? Well, if you dismantle it the way the Health and Human Services Secretary nominee, Tom Price, is suggesting, you would just completely get rid of it and we'd, you'd replace it with the health savings accounts and so on. Uh, in the case of... Well, for poor, for poor people, that would just be... It, it's a disaster. And because what goes along with the, those, all the Republican plans almost is block granting, so-called block granting of Medicaid, which means that instead of having federal money to be there for whatever patients, whatever people need it, uh, a limited uh, dollar amount with a ceiling goes to each state so that if there are more people that need the uh, health services. Uh, if there are new treatments that might be available that are more expensive, the states can't go back to the federal government and say, oh, this just happened, we need uh, more money. So the states would have a limited amount of money, which would limit ultimately the services, uh, both quantitatively and qualitatively, that people would be eligible for. So we see that as a disaster for uh, disadvantage for poor people uh, who have to live in a state that is, uh, that, that is uh, in a block grant situation. Do you have a sense of what really might happen with the Affordable Care Act? Um, what are your soundings well, among your it, yeah. political contacts yeah. telling you? Sure. Well, I, you know, there's, there's, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of noise uh, in social media and the news and everywhere else, and even among the informal groups of uh, people that we work with. Uh, but I think everyone is pretty convinced that, that uh, the Affordable Care Act is going to go. Um, hmm. And, uh, you really think so? I, well, I think so. <laughs> Me personally, 
Do you think right. there's a chance it might not go? Well, I think the rhetoric on the Republican, Republican side now ties them up a little bit because they, they yeah. talk ab about repealing Obamacare and replacing it right. with something that's just as good, if not better. And, and doing it almost simultaneously in some right. cases. Correct. And so I think that has, has them <laughs> trapped a little bit because people will be watching about what the replacement is. Right. And, you know, what things it can ad address and what things it can't accomplish. Um, I, I think... I think the jury's out on whether it will be repealed. I think that it'll be changed. I think there will be some, you know, m maybe some designation about states controlling certain aspects, having more control over it as opposed to it being a federal mandate. Right. Um, well, you know, and keeping certain yeah. things, uh, you know, in in the plan and and so, changing others, but. I think the jury's out. Right. So, but there's like three active Republican plans floating on around out there. One comes from the sort of Tom Price contingent of the Republican Party. A second one from Rand Paul, right. which is very much libertarian oriented. The third one is led by a physician who's a senator from Louisiana. And he is proposing a point where states actually have the option of keeping, in essence, uh, the Affordable Care Plan and expanded Medicaid. <laughs> Or not. Right. So you, you have some kid living on, the, you know, this side of the state line who's got nothing, and this kid, it was, oh, his his governor decided they'd keep it. Just kind of creates this sort of random hodgepodge of people who have access to a better system and people who don't. And so I can't imagine like, how that kind of system would be financed. But exactly. So the replacement things that Karen, maybe and maybe this could end up being the real Achilles heel there. That uh, you know they just can't find a, a replacement that would be, uh, that the public would accept. And more imp interestingly, there are a lot of Republican governors who are getting a lot of money to support, 95% right. of the Medicaid costs coming from the federal government. Right. A lot of governors from both parties are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, not so fast. So I guess it's possible. Uh, I don't know how the Trump administration would handle that since that was, <laughs> I guess, the number one promise in addition to the wall. Uh, that, that he'd have to kind of step back from. I guess it's possible, or maybe... They just need to change the name. They just need to, Not yeah, we, we got rid of it. Right. We, we, alternative yeah. facts, <laughs> alternative <laughs> names, we got everything. Yeah, yeah, alternative facts, exactly. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's in their wheelhouse. Um, we've got only a little more than 30 seconds left, but um, tell me in that little bit of time how the whole idea of the Children's Health Fund came up and how you guys got it started. So let me just say that uh, I met Paul Simon through my affiliation with USA for Africa. We were both, he was a singer and I was helping distribute the funds. He wanted to do something in New York for homelessness where he, uh, because he lived there. We went and did a tour of the welfare hotels and shelters in New York City and were totally blown away. He is a superstar, me as a physician, and we just vowed that we needed to do something to help children. Because there was devastation in, in It things. was indescribable. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> that's, that's how it started. And from that colonel, Karen, uh, we, Paul, and, Paul and I took Karen out to dinner to talk her into <laughs> putting the whole thing together administratively. She agreed, thankfully. And, uh, you know, and here we are. Three decades later. Yeah. So now three decades later, you're not just in, um, in New York. I mean, how many states are you in? In, in 15 states and, New York, and D.C. Oh, my goodness. That's yeah. great. Anyway, I wish we had more time, but thank you so much for coming in. Oh, thank Thanks you. For, I appreciate it. Thanks for it. having us. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. When it comes to foreign policy, the most powerful person in the country, apart from Donald Trump, is Steve Bannon. Bannon is Trump's highly secretive chief White House strategist and senior counselor, a position the New York Times described as an enormously influential post. Trump has also given Bannon a formal seat on the Principles Committee of the National Security Council, a critically important gathering where the most sensitive matters of war and peace are analyzed and discussed and the most far-reaching and consequential strategies are formulated. To have a political appointee like Bannon given a seat on that committee is unprecedented. John McCain called it a radical departure. Susan Rice, who served as President Obama's national security advisor, called Bannon's appointment stone-cold crazy. 
Who is Steve Bannon? We know he's the former head of Breitbart News, an online publication beloved by white supremacists, extreme right-wing ideologues, and haters of women. Among those cheering Trump's appointment of Bannon as his top advisor were the chairman of the American Nazi Party and David Duke, former imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. The entire time I was reading through the research material for this commentary, I felt like taking a shower. Bannon has denounced liberal women as, quote, a bunch of dykes that came from the Seven Sisters schools. According to a Breitbart headline, quote, birth control makes women unattractive and crazy, close quote. After attacking Republican congressional leaders, in which he labeled them with an anti-woman slur so grotesque, I can't even begin to repeat it here, Bannon declared, let the grassroots turn on the hate. This is the top advisor to the President of the United States. We know some things about him, and as far as I'm concerned, none of it is good. But we need to know so much more. It's time for a much brighter media spotlight to be thrown on the history and the current activities of Steve Bannon. That's all for now. See you next time.